Good morning. You know, welcome to our series on not a fan and how we begin talking about challenging you to rather than being a fan, which the dictionary would define as somebody that's an enthusiastic admirer, but not someone whose lives is really transformed by somebody who knows facts about somebody else or something else. What we're talking about is being true followers where we know facts about Jesus and God. We know those facts, but it's transforming and changing our lives. I'm just sitting there thinking this morning, you know, you know I really probably don't even need to preach this message this morning because with it pouring down rain outside, we've all got followers here today, don't we? The fans say, so you're all, fo-. but just in case you're not all, I'll go ahead and preach the message, okay? Just in case. Uh, today we're talking about the open invitation. And I got to thinking about, do you ever watch any of those ads, you know, that come on TV and our radio also too, but you'll see the ad and they talk about this great product and then all of a sudden at the end, you hear this low volume, fast talking guy come on and he starts talking about all that you can't hear what he's saying, but he's saying something like this. Everything I've just said is false. In fact, if you come to the place and try to buy this, you couldn't buy this even if you want to. We only have one that's left, and it's gone. And uh, only if you offer your firstborn son could you actually get this product. Or whatever. But whatever they're saying, I'm saying they're discounting everything that they just said. Have you ever, in fact, I was pulling a little ad out of a magazine. They'll, they'll advertise a, maybe a little drug, and then they give you several pages of what all's wrong or what could go wrong. This one happened to be Botox. Great, boy, well, she's a good looking girl there and everything. But then as soon as you start reading, it says, this may cause serious side effects. It can be life threatening. You, if you have problems swallowing, speaking, or breathing due to weakening of associated muscles, which can be severe and result in loss of life. It continues on including loss of strength and overall muscle weakness, double vision, blurred vision, drooping eyelids, hoarseness, or change of loss of voice, double say, trouble saying words clearly. <clears throat> <laughs> I didn't think you could tell. Loss of bladder control. Now, that's been an interesting one there. Uh, trouble breathing, trouble swallowing. If this happens, do not drive a car, operate machinery, or do other dangerous activities or, or try to parent your kids, you know. <laughs> what I like about Jesus is he's just a straight shooter. He didn't qualify. He didn't offer something and say something, and then you have to read two or three pages of all the qualifications. You didn't have to go through everything that he's talking about to understand what he's saying. No, he, he was not a low-volume, fast-talking, small-print kind of guy. He's a straight shooter, and he didn't mince words. When he told us things, he told them just like they were. He called it like it was. You know, Jesus doesn't have opinions. <laughs> when you or I talk, it, we may have an opinion. He doesn't have an opinion. When he speaks, he is, as we learn at Christmas time, he is God in the flesh. When he speaks, it's truth. It's not opinion. It's truth. So he tells us what we need to know, and there's no need for fine print, small print, or anything. He doesn't mince words. Now, What he does is he gives an open invitation for all to follow. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. There's no asterisk there. You don't have to go down to the bottom of the page and and read the small print. He makes no bones about what he is inviting us to do. It's to follow him. You can follow him. He's inviting us. In fact, if, if you could circle the words, any of you or whatever your translation, your Bible has, circle that there. Any of you. He doesn't qualify who he's inviting. You're already qualified. He doesn't say, well, I don't mean people who have a rap sheet. I don't mean people who have a sexual past. 
I don't mean people who've had a divorce or a hurt or a habit or a hang-up or a hypocrite or a legalist or hard-hearted or hard-headed or angry or bitter or depressed or anxiety-filled. He doesn't say, I don't mean if that's you. He doesn't qualify anybody. The invitation is for everybody. It's for all. It's for anybody who's ever thought they've gone too far and God could never take them back. It's for anybody who thinks that their sin is too big. It's for anybody who's ever looked in the mirror and wondered, what in the world have I become? I had a good friend one time. He looked at me and he was very serious. In fact, he was so serious it scared me. I didn't tell him that. He looked and he said, Rule, if you knew what I've done, you would not be my friend. And I looked at him and said, you know, God doesn't care about your past, and I don't care about your past. What's true now is what God's doing in you right now. And I'm going to be your friend <laughs> regardless of what your past is. And I've got the feeling that I didn't want to hear it either. <laughs> But you know, that's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? We've all got a past, but Jesus comes and says, if any of you wants to be my follower, that's not the issue as to whether you're invited. You are invited. He accepts you where you are. The question is, will you accept him? Because you're invited. <laughs> all are. And what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Because as we talked about last week, unfortunately, we would have to say some of us as Christians are just fans. We're not really followers. And, and by the way, following him is not a punishment. John 10.10 10 tells us, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. In other words, what we're talking about is something that's going to result in good for you, a better life for you. What is it? What does it mean? Being a follower of Jesus means I constantly accept his open invitation. You know, back in Jesus' day, the rabbis would go, and in fact, you know, it was difficult to become a follower of a rabbi. They were called Talmids, T-A-L-M-I-D-S. And not every Jewish boy could make that cut. They had to be very impressive in their knowledge. They had to know all about the Old, Old Testament and the Torah, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In fact, they would know those books literally by heart, would be able to answer questions about that. In fact, you know, the reputation of the rabbi was dependent on how well the student did. So it was very hard to get in and be a follower of a rabbi. It'd be like Getting into Harvard or Yale, you'd have to have 36 on your ACT and 4.0 and all your grades. And lo and behold, here comes this rabbi inviting anybody that wanted to to follow him. Here's this scandalous rabbi with this scandalous invitation. I mean, he invites Peter and Andrew and James and John who are fishermen and Judas who's a a political zealot, and, and Levi, Matthew, who was the tax collector. Oh, no more ostracized and hated than he was. I mean, how does this group become the Talmuds of this strange rabbi? They accepted the invitation. They took him up on the invitation. And when Jesus says, any of you, that's what he means. The last, the least, the lost, the finest and foremost, and all in between. And from 2,000 years ago, even to now, he's saying to you, and he's saying to me, would you follow me? He's asking you right now. Will you follow me? Will you follow me? He doesn't care what you've done or what you've left undone. He doesn't care if you're at the top of the class or the bottom of the class. He doesn't care if you're in the White House or the outhouse. He doesn't care if you're on the wrong side of the tracks or the right side of the tracks. He doesn't care what the color of your skin is. He doesn't care if you're pure or unpure. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters that Jesus loves you and is calling you now to follow him. And he doesn't just call once. I mean, he comes knocking. He comes after you. Kind of like a hound dog. 
You know, he, he gets you sent, and he's going to go after you. He's going to stay with you. So he's going to continue trying to find you and come after you. And if you've ever heard his whisper in your heart, follow me, and you've resisted, you're not done with him. He cares for you and he loves for you and he's going to continue coming after you. You know, think about the people that God used in the Bible. I mean, Abraham lied. Sarah laughed at God's promises. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit very well. John Mark was rejected by Paul. Timothy had ulcers. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Amos' only training was in the school of fig tree pruning. Jacob was a liar. David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Jesus was too poor. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus, well, he was dead. <laughs> John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer, and so was Moses, and so was David. Jonah ran from God. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out. John the Baptist was a loudmouth. Martha was a worrywart. Mary may have been lazy. Samson had long hair. Noah got drunk. Did I mention that Moses had a short fuse and Peter and Paul and lots of other folks? Which leads to the second invitation. Being a follower of Jesus means I consistently stop making excuses. <laughs> he offers the invitation and we stop making excuses and accept that invitation and become a follower. I mean, all of these that I listed, they could have all said, oh, I can't. Here's why. Jesus dealt with excuses in Luke 9, 57 through 62. He says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I mean, here Jesus is, here's three guys that's all got in common. Jesus has said, follow me, and all three of them have excuses. Let's look a little deeper at those excuses. The first person says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, you know what? You know, he really doesn't give his excuse, but I think he's reading his heart. He said, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. I don't have a place to call home. Now, obviously, Jesus must not have been listening to TV Christianity because if he just had faith, he could have had a whole lot more than what he had. Here, Jesus said, yeah, I don't have anything. Not going to have anything. In other words, what he was saying to him, this is not going to be a comfortable walk. Some of us want comfortable Christianity. Some of us want Jesus without any cost. Can you think of anything of value that doesn't cost? When you start talking about a, a world-class athlete, how do they become world-class? You talk about a concert pianist. How do they become a concert pianist? How, how long is a concert pianist going to play in public? How long is the concert? Hour and a half? How much practice time did that involve? How much time each day? Maybe six to eight hours in a room, a little small room with a little piano, nobody around. Day after day after day after day. And then whether it's the athlete or the concert pianist, they only perform in public for a short amount of time. It's not always comfortable. Sometimes I think we just say, well, yeah, I'll follow Jesus. You know, it's kind of like he's the flavor of the month. But it's going to cost. There'll be some cost. And the Scripture talks about counting the cost. And that's what this person was talking about was comfort. Then the second person said, let me go and bury my dad. Now, if you understand the first century culture and what's going on here, when, when somebody in your family died, you just buried them right then. They didn't have embalming back in those days. It's kind of like, 
When we go into the interior of the Congo, we know that if we die, they're not going to ship the body back. They'll bury you right there, and you'll now be Congolese. There's, there's where the places we were, they didn't embalm. That's just part of what's going to happen. So he's really, his dad's still alive. You understand that? So it's what he's saying, basically, is I want to go back and stay there until my father dies. And what we'll do is, you know, they put him in the ground, and then they mourn him for 30 days. And then what happened? Then I'll get my inheritance. That was really where this thing was going. And that's where Jesus was pinning him down on the fact that he wanted to get his money. And Jesus was saying to him, are you going to love me or are you going to love your money? Do you know the Bible talks more about money than faith? in heaven than prayer wonder why that is you ever riddled that one <laughs> I think it's because it really is, is so much about it and I think for many of us it's the thing that keeps us a fan what money buys and what we can do with it and how we care about it, it steals our heart for God quicker than just about any other thing this second person wanted money I was doing some just trying to research what the latest statistics may be. I imagine they stay pretty much closely the same. It says that 3% of Christians tithe. I find that hard to believe. I hope it's not true. I hope it's not true in this church. 3%. But then it said the general Christians uh, uh, across the board average giving like 2 point whatever percent of their income. That's a fan. It's not a fault. <laughs> Those are folks that's not all in. Because that really strikes at the heart of where we are. I mean, you know, when you talk about my money, I'm really, talk, I get really possessive then. The second person's excuse was that. Third person says, let me say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said, you know, when you put your hand to the plow, how many of you have plowed by hand? Oh, okay, we got some down here. My neighbors are plowing by hand. When, my dad would talk about that all the time. But, you know, when, you get, when you're plowing behind the mule and everything, if you're looking back, you're going you're to be plowing crooked roads. And Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and gets going. In other words, once you get to following Jesus and once you go him, you're not looking back anymore. You're not saying, oh, I sure wish I could go back to that. Oh, I sure wish I could do that. You know, and you, you see some people like, and they're just all time wishing for what life used to be. He said, no, when you put your hand to the plow, now it's straight hard. We're going in a new direction now. And, and this third person wanted to look back. The difference in a fan and a follower. A follower is all in and he's going forward now. We make all kinds of excuses but the wise Christ follower lives with a kind of an internal radar going on in their life that I'm going to read God's Word, I'm going to know God's Word, and I'm going to do God's Word, and I'm going to make no excuses for that. God invites us to be the kinds of followers that when we hear Him say, come follow me, we also hear Him say, quit making excuses. In line with this, uh, we're doing a couple of interviews today, and I'm going to ask Jarrett Johnson, if he will, to come forward uh, at this time, and I'm going to talk with him. John Hicks is being interviewed in the other, but Jarrett was born in Florida, grew up and played uh, football, had a very distinguished career at the University of Alabama, for all of you Alabama uh, fans uh, out there. In fact, was a uh, uh, drafted then in 2003 by the Baltimore Ravens, and he's played uh, with them until last year, and now uh, plays with the San Diego Chargers. And uh, welcome. Man, it's good to see you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have you guys mic on there? Hello, hello. There you go. You know, when, when you think about somebody who has distinguished yourself in the athletic world like that and the price that you've had uh, to pay, I know something like that just didn't happen uh, overnight. And I'm, I'm wondering, what does it take? To get at a high level uh, you know and there's a lot of factors that go into a career you know obviously talent is is one um, you know really strong self-motivated people um, 
But um, you know, I, I think the, the most important thing is, is uh, you know, people that are persistent and are consistently getting better. Um, you know, my goal going when I when I got first got in the NFL, I just wanted to make it two years, and I was okay at the beginning. But my goal every year was to just get better, just a little bit better than the year than the year before. And uh, my my fourth year, I moved positions and then started doing well. And every year, I just I just want to get better than last year and better than last year, and it just keeps going and going. Um, you know, another thing is is being able to handle the the peaks and the valleys. When you know when things are good, not getting too cocky and too arrogant, because bad times are going to come, injuries are going to come, you know, bad season, coaching changes, and when things are bad, you know, can you keep your head up and stay persistent? Okay, don't answer all my questions and all. <laughs> that, that was good. Right. We'll, I thought we're going to knock it out in one. Right, Sorry. Right. We'll we'll get to some of those about uh, what keeps you from giving up, but that's amazing uh, that you can say that you know when, when you're at a level that none of us would ever. Uh, get to that you're still trying to get better and that a uh, that's, that's a great quality there what's the hardest thing about what you do uh, probably the, the the constant pressure to perform you know you know injuries you know tough luck keep playing you got the flu tough sorry for your loss <laughs> keep playing death in the family you know, if it's it doesn't raining, matter. do you still come to church? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. You know, but it's, it's just a constant, it's, it's the never-ending, you know, you, you have a great game, you feel great, and coaches are happy with it. Next week you have a bad game, and they're ready to get rid of you. So it's, it's you know, a never-ending pressure to perform. Also, well, so in the midst of that kind of uh, pressure, how do you motivate yourself to, to, to stay? Obviously, you have to be mentally tough and to keep going and to keep pushing. How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of factors that motivate you. Um, you know, most of the guys in the NFL are pretty self-motivated guys. But uh, I think one thing that people miss and don't realize is the majority of them um, are, are, you know, they have talent, but their talent is not what carries them. They, most of them have a, a huge chip on their shoulder over something, whether it's something that happened in middle school or where they got drafted or, you know, Ray Lewis is one of the most motivating guys, one of the most, you know, inspiring guys I've ever played with, and he can never get over the fact that when he got to college that he was 185 pounds. They told him he was too small to play linebacker, and he'll, he'll never forget it. And uh, you know, and you know, I have a lot of things that, that that drive me. I've had I've had six guys drafted in the first and second round of my position, and you know, they they come in, and I'm like, not this year, big boy, you know. And but so there's <laughs> there's things that that uh, that always motivate you. All right. Uh, now I, I got an interesting question because um, you know we're talking about excuses and excuses. Make, I, I'm just guessing that maybe you have seen uh, other players who have the talent that you have, maybe even superior talent, uh, or, or other coaches, and, and for whatever reason, uh, they've not made it. What are, what are some of the excuses that you hear yeah. from people? I mean, it's countless. There's, I've played with way more guys that, that had the talent and didn't make it than the ones that stayed. Wow. Um, but, you know, it's everything from, you know, usually it's the coaches hated me and they never gave me a shot or they had some – you know, phantom injury that that held them back, or you know, there's 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 tons of excuses you hear, but you know, there's there's very there's a ton of guys that 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 have the ability, have the talent, that that just can't get focused enough and and stop looking at all the things that are around them instead of focusing on you know their own issues and what's really holding them back. Wow, well, that's that's got to be sad to see that. Happening. Yeah, it's and, tough because I see guys that have way more talent than me all the time. I'm like, man, yeah. I wish I had a tenth of your talent, yeah. but you just won't, you know, you, you won't shut up about the coaches and you always know, all someone those. else's fault. Always, always. Some reason why I can't do it. Uh, how often do you feel like giving up? Um, every training camp. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whenever I'm in Niceville and fishing's good, but. Um, uh, you know, training camp is, is tough for me every year. I think I call my wife. Probably every training camp and told her that I'm retiring. Uh, I, you know, I hate it. And, I forgot to uh, say so you're married to Anna. Yeah. Stand up, babe. There you go. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, training camps, you know, the longest days, you know, same practice every day. It's, it's miserable, you know. But. Okay, so what keeps you going? You feel like giving up? Oh, I think people can identify with feel like giving up. What keeps you going? Uh, you know, you just fall back on, you know, what got you there, you know, um, you know, that, that you, 
even though things are bad, you know, the next day the sun's going to rise and you're going to get after it again. And the next day might be better than, 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 than the day you're in right now. And uh, so there's, you know, it's just, you're just constantly, just constantly going, you know, even though, even in training camp when things are bad, you're constantly looking for the day, next day, maybe tomorrow will be better. And, and, you know, I'm going to keep falling back on, on what, me, what got me here and what keeps driving me. And just, mm -hmm. do, you ever, do you have a, like a goal out there that, you're, that you keep saying, okay, here's the goal, here's the goal, you know, and, and when the bad things are happening and when you feel like giving up, you say, no, I, I want that. I always, you know, and especially during training camp, I always kind of go, you know, when, when things are really bad, and a lot of times, usually about the second week of training camp, I stop playing good. I, I'll start a little bit rusty. About day four or five in, I'm, I'm peaking, I'm, I'm killing. And then the second week, when you start getting sore, you start getting tired of it, sick of your coaches, sick of your teammates, is when I'll start playing bad. And when, when that happens, what I'll start is start, you know, focusing on the fundamentals. Instead of focusing on one big play, I'll focus on, you know, my first step or where my hands are. And, you know, once I get that first step and that, where my hands are and my place, my head placement and everything, you know, that's one small fundamental step will carry into the rest of the play ends up pretty good. And then you carry it over to the next play, the next day. And all of a sudden you turn around, you had a great practice. And, uh, you know, so, you know, when things are really bad, you focus on the little stuff. And it's also interesting to see here you're talking more about practice, practice, practice uh, versus a game. There's way more of those in our game. <laughs> Let's give it up for Jerry. I don't thank you for coming and sharing. Thank you. Thank you. That is really, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just so much truth and so much in uh, what Jared has shared with us. You know, and uh, of course, you know, I'm just incredibly impressed with someone that achieves at that level and, and, and the price they pay. And then I say, pay, and then I say, how much more? If, if we do it for things of the world, and, and, and you, you may do it in, in your career and other things, how much more, though, should we do it for Jesus? How much more should we not make excuses? How much more should we be all in? How much more should we do whatever it takes? How much more? And that really, really leads us to the, the last thing of what it means to be a follower is, is to I continually submit myself to him. In other words, basically, I am all in. I am totally surrendered. Now, we don't like the word submit. We don't like the word surrender, those kinds of things. Um, and I was trying to think, oh, yeah, what's a better word? Maybe it's yield. <laughs> I'm going to yield my life to him. I'm going to turn everything over to him to where I take my wants, my desires, and place them under his. I think Jesus modeled that. I remember one time when he was, um, he was tired and he was wanting to go off and be alone and he was wanting to read his Bible and, and talk with God, and yet the people were hounding him and were still all around and he was looking at him and said you know he had compassion on him and he took his own personal needs and he put those aside and he went to minister to the people and then in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus said not my will but thine be done that's basically what it is it says not my will any longer but yours and I'm going to do whatever it takes and, and all of us feel like quitting sometimes all of us feel like giving up sometimes and the Christian life is not comfortable. It's not easy. And there are times where we all struggle. And we don't like the players that we're with. And we don't like the coaches. And we, you know, we don't like, but it's not about the players and the coaches in the Christian. It's about following Jesus and doing him. You know, let me close with this. And then I want to leave us a little time just to um, pray and, and, and respond today. You know, in, on Facebook, you get these invitation to events all the time. I get these, and I delete them all, so <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity event deleter. But, you know, they have three options. When you get invited to an event, you can join, you can hit maybe, or you can hit decline. And I start thinking about that, you know, so that's really... You know, you're being invited to be a fan or a follower, to make a decision. Am I going to be a fan of Jesus? Am I going to be a follower of Jesus? And which button are you going to hit? Some of you are hearing God's call for the first time. Some of you are hearing Jesus saying, follow me, follow me. 
Some of you are hearing it for the hundredth time. Some of you are hearing it for the thousandth time. Whatever, follow me. And today is the time, today is the day where you need to press the join button. I'm going to, I'm going to follow. I'm going to do that. Now, some of you may hit the maybe button. And you know what? For a, for a small group of you, the maybe button is an okay button to hit. In a church like this, there, there are people that are at different places in their spiritual life, and there are a lot of people are coming for the first time. This may be the first time you're here today. Or you may have been here for a month or two months, and you're just kind of, you're, you're still not sure about all this stuff. You're, you're not sure about who Jesus is, and you're not sure about uh, a number of things. And you're just trying to find what the truth is, and you'd, you'd categorize yourself as the seeker. And that's okay. I think God's patient with us. When you're sincerely searching for the truth, you know, uh, he's, he's patient with you as you seek to find that truth. And the maybe button's okay for you. I, what really concerns me, we've got probably hundreds of us <laughs> that come every week and for a long time. We're just pressing the maybe button every Sunday. That's a problem. I mean, somewhere or another, you got to quit pressing the maybe button. So it's time, it's time to hit the join button and become a follower. Some of you will hit the decline button. And I understand that. There'll be people here who will say, you know, I've, I've been hurt by the church. I've been hurt by a pastor. I've been hurt by Christians. And I don't want a big part of it. And I get that, I understand that, and I would like to say to you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for whatever church or pastor or Christian has hurt you. I know that's a difficult thing and a different, difficult problem to follow. But I tell you what, at some point in time, I pray that you can get beyond that. Some point in time we say, you know, I'm going to go on. I'm going to move forward. Because the truth of the matter is, we're not asking you to follow this church. We're not asking you to follow any of the pastors. And we aren't asking you to follow any of the Christians. What we're asking you to follow is Jesus. <laughs> He's the one that we all follow. Ultimately, we all get let down by a church or people or a pastor because we're all human beings. We've all failed. We don't fully live up to everything that we believe and espouse and say. So to those of you that hit the decline button, I would simply say to you, I pray that shortly you're going to be able to move beyond your past hurts and just hit the join button. So where are, about you? We've got a few minutes this morning, and I hear the rain. You're not going to rush out to the beach anyway, are you? Now, we do have another service, so we do have to end. But we've built some time in this service. We've got three or four minutes now. And what I want to do is just the band's going to play. You might like to, to come up here and kneel and pray. You'd be welcome to do that. Uh, in our weight room, we have prayers after the service. You might want to go and have somebody pray for them. But I want just to spend some time, and I want to ask you the question, are you going to be a fan of Jesus or are you going to be a follower of Jesus? If you're ready to press the join button, I want, I'd just invite you to come up here and kneel down and pray. I'll hang around a little bit afterwards if you'd like to talk. Uh, I'd be glad to do that. I invite you to pray, and I invite you to respond now and just take two or three minutes. Be quiet before the Lord. If he moves you to come forward and say, you know, because sometimes you just need to draw a line in the sand. Sometimes you just need to take a step and say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the Word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.